Yes. Yeah, see. Okay. So this, we're continuing with the uh, with the tulip and um, total depravity, uh, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and of the saints. Somebody's calling here. Hold on a second. That's all right. All right. So we did. Uh, we we covered a lot of this stuff. We know about uh, total depravity. You know, we know that uh, uh, we're made from the uh, the corrupt dust of the earth. You know, uh, when you go back to Genesis one one, you know, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and then you can sh switch right over to Revelation twelve and nine uh, when uh, the angel was was uh, fighting up in heaven and uh, Satan was cast out with a third of his angels and they were cast out into the earth. Boom, and then Genesis 1, 2. And the earth became without void, uh, without form and void. And the spirit was on the uh, the waters. Uh, so that's what happened. Uh, and, uh, and and after uh, God uh, did that uh, creation aspect in, in the first verse, he did the making and forming. Uh, forming. Um, um, most people call that the six days of creation. Well, it wasn't six days of creation. It was one day of creation. Uh, ex nihilio, which means out of nothing. So from nothing, uh, he created everything. And then uh, from that, he, he made and formed. And um, I, I, we can go through all of these, these, these words here, uh, making and forming, you know, when you got the created in the beginning, and then the making and the forming, you, you want to look at the differences because we, we, we define everything. Uh, this, this is how we understand uh, the Bible. This is how we learn. In the beginning, in the beginning, God created. Created. The word is uh, bara. Create, and it's a righteous thing. You know. Uh, and then um, we get this here, and then that, and then He does His making and His forming. Um, there's a word down here somewhere. Um. I'm seeing, uh, I can't think of the word right now, but it's Yatsa. Uh, Yatsa. Made. Here it is. Is that it? That's made. Uh, Asa is, is due. And there's another one here. I can't think of it right now. But uh, I wasn't going to go here, so I, I'm not ready for this anyway. So I like I said days of making and forming and in those six days on on uh, on the sixth day he, he made uh, uh man you know and what did he make him from uh, he made him from the uh the corrupt dust of, of the earth uh, uh, and how did it become uh corrupt um when 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 satan was cast um uh, into the earth he corrupted the whole the whole universe the, the stars are not clean in his eyes, you know, uh, so nothing is clean after that. And um, and that was on the sixth day. Right. So uh, we're made from corrupt us. So when, when you hear these guys argue about, you know, when, when did the uh, why do we need grace? You know, uh, why, why is there a unconditional election? Why do we need an atonement? Um, you know, uh, it goes back to uh, before, you know, uh, when we were created, not not from the fall, because uh, the, the fall was inevitable, you know, uh, uh, because of, of the corruption that was uh, before it. And that's why we need all of these things. And because um, these a lot of these guys, argue, like I said, I've been in the history books looking up uh, personalities and, and, and biographies and things and, and Calvin and Arminius and, and Augustine and uh, Pelagian, Pelagian and, uh, and all of these guys and they're all, all going back and forth uh, but we're in the uh, Calvin and uh, Augustine camp you know and uh, and we believe this stuff uh, we believe uh, that man is totally depraved you know we're, we're so affected by the negative consequences of original sin and we're we're really incapable you know there's there's none good no not one Nobody seeks after God, and if anybody does seek God, it's God putting a seeking in them, you know. So uh, we're, we're we're good, we're good that way. And then um, we we did, uh, you know, unconditional election is is contested uh, by a lot of people, but uh, we know that uh, 
we, we have to be unconditionally elected so because we, we always choose evil you know um, so he has to uh, elect some and then uh, of those you get the, uh, a limited amount uh, are elected and and, and 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 reach atonement you know so this is the big thing that people fight over the limited atonement because you got all these verses in the Bible that say that uh, he doesn't want anybody uh, to die he wants everyone to be saved and and we know that that uh, everyone is the all it's the believing all it's not the whole world uh, uh, God loved uh, the whole world uh, that he gave that he gave his only begotten son and whoever believes in him shall uh, shall be eternal life John 3 16 is, is one of is the famous verse they throw up but we know that that's talking about he so loved the world it's a condition there and uh, but what, what does it go back to? It goes John back to John three fourteen. You know, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, uh, so must the, the Son of Man be lifted up. And um, that's the so. You know, and when they were in the wilderness, they murmured against uh, God. Actually, they murmured against Moses, and they they said, "You, well, we're going to die in this wilderness." And then, and God said, "I had enough of these people." He sent the serpents, uh, the brave, the uh, the serpents, and they were dying. The people and the people were dying from the, getting bitten by the serpents. By the snakes, and uh, um, Moses intervened, and, and God told them to put the serpent on a pole, a brazen serpent on a, on a brazen pole, and, and raise the serpent up. And whoever looked after they were bit lived, and if they didn't look, they didn't live. And not everybody looked, so uh, that's where we get to look and live. And as the Son of Man should be lifted up, and not everybody looks, so not everybody lives. So it's it's a limited atonement. And then we skipped into we went to perseverance of the saints and we, we spent a, a little bit of time on that. And um, let me see, since God has decreed the elect and they cannot resist grace, they are unconditionally and eternally secure in that election. And, you know, a lot of people get into uh, fatalism and, and apathy and they think you don't have to do anything uh, but because, uh, you know, it's. Uh, we're, it's unconditional and, and if you're elect you're elect uh, forever and, and this is true and um and you don't have to do anything well we do we have we still have to work we still have to do stuff and this is this is god working in us and we know that and we spent uh, a couple of weeks on the perseverance of the saints we got to persevere uh, we have to go through a lot um the perseverance is uh um we, we, we went through the, uh, the warnings uh, for perseverance and we went through uh, the, the encouragement to persevere and there's a whole lot of synonyms we went through and verses uh, dozens and dozens of verses on, on waiting persevering uh, continuance faith self-denial long-suffering patience endurance hope steadfastness and all of these things have to do with uh, with perseverance and then putting on the uh, whole armor of god you know so and we went through a lot of that kind of thing. and then the unconditional election you know god has a family uh that he knew before the foundation of the world and if you're in that family you're going to heaven if you're not you're going to hell and that's based that's it in a nutshell you know that's uh that's predestination and, and that's election and they, and they go together and we looked at a lot of verses there. I'm not going to run through all of them. And uh, but the, 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 the words we got from there, uh, uh, chosen and elect, uh, is this Old Testament uh, 972 is uh, uh, book, book here. Uh, it's, it's chosen, elect. We went through a lot of verses there. Um, and uh, 977, Obakar is chosen. We went through verses there, over 100 some odd verses there. We went through a couple of them, and then the um, the Greek at uh, Klegomai. Um, uh, uh, there was a bunch of them in 1586, uh, uh, 88. I know there's more than that, but then there's 1588, uh, 1589, uh, and we went through all of these chosen. Uh, words here. There's a lot of verses. There's 19 here. A collegomai means to choose, to choose out, to make a choice, to pick out, and um, that's what he did. And uh, also here is uh, eclectos. That's the uh, the chosen, and that's the elect. And there's uh, 23 verses on that. 
and then uh, this, this is a ecloge, is election or chosen. So that's what we are. We're chosen. We're picked out. And um, and you'll see. Um, and with these, a lot of these election and chosen words, you'll also see grace associated with that. And that's uh, the next thing we're going to look at is the uh, the irresistible grace uh, of this uh, tulip doctrine, uh, so to speak. And that, like I said, it's not T U L I P. It's it's one complete doctrine, and that's how they broke it up into uh, into a nice little thing like that, you know, so we can remember uh, tulip. Uh, Romans 11, we'll get into that a little bit. Uh, it's a good good chapter. Romans 11 and, and Ephesians uh, talking about grace. As you can see here, you got election and grace here, but Romans 11 and 5. Let me just try it out real quick here. Romans 11 and 5. Uh, even so, that at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election, the cloge of grace. And we're going to get, get into charis. We're going to get into grace. And I'll put those words up here. Um, it, it's an election is it's it's a gift you know it's a free gift um let me see i got 54. Oh, let me put the words up first if i got them here maybe i didn't even write them down here we got uh yeah okay 54 86 486 okay um 85 54, uh, that's favor. Uh, and fifty-four eighty-three three. That's that one. And then this is sixty-three or something, right? Yeah, sixty-three. That just means rejoice. Okay, so we'll, but this um this charisma is a gift, it's a free gift, a favor which one receives without any merit of his own. And, that's the perfect definition right there. So, Gaius, it's, it's unmerited favor. And 5483 is the charizomai. It means to forgive, uh, to do something pleasant or agreeable, and it's forgiveness. And 5485 is charis, which is grace or favor, uh, that which affords joy or pleasure. And, of course, uh, that's what we get when we... Uh, we feel that uh, we'll, we we have that charis, you know, it's uh, the merciful kindness by which God exerting his holy influence upon souls, turns them to Christ, keeps, strengthens, increases them in Christian faith, knowledge, affection, and kindness. So, but it's more than that. It's, it's him uh, giving us something that we don't deserve because uh, we know that uh, <laughs> we're totally depraved. So, you know, uh, and without this charis, without this grace, um, we, we go the way we're supposed to go. Uh, we deserve nothing but hell. And uh, uh, if if God uh, just destroyed everybody, uh, that would be within his right, you know, and, and he'd be doing justice. Um, but this unmerited favor, this uh, irresistible grace is given to the elect, uh, to the limit, limited atoned. Uh, and, and, and we get it. Hope, hopefully, you know, and um, we're going to get into some of these verses here. Um, I was looking at... Uh, I, I don't want to go crazy reading all this stuff because I got pages and pages of stuff that I read and it would take me hours just to read it all. But I try to pop things out that, that stick out of my mind, you know. And um, I'm going to get something uh, that I took out of this uh, Hastings. There's a few, uh, few, few, few paragraphs. I guess I can get into that, you know. And it talks about um, uh, what election is, you know. Um, uh, and it talks about, uh, I'm getting into the mi middle of a paragraph here, but uh, it says in harmony with, with such positions, and we, I'm not going to go over all the positions because there's so many of them, um, in, in harmony with such positions, election is a preordination of blessings and rewards for such as are foreseen to be worthy of them. And actually nobody's worthy of them, but, you know, it, it, we're only worthy because he makes us worthy. You know, uh, there is no predestination to sin, although there is a foreknowledge of it. And then he, this guy goes on to talk about uh, repudiating uh, stoic fatalism. And we already went over that, you know, just because we're elected, we're, we're just not going to sit around and do nothing. That's that's fatalism. 
and you know, what's the sense of doing anything? You know, either you're going one way or the other. Uh, I'm dead. I'm going to hell. So who cares? You know, well, that's fatalism. You know, and if you think you're going to heaven, you don't have to do anything. That's that's fatalism too. You know. And it goes on here. He says the the world is but the expression of God, God's own immediate will is the sole cause of all things. In the view of God's eternal knowledge, the natural man is evil, only depraved, morally insufficient, and helpless from the identity of the race of Adam. So tremendous an effect is attributed to the fall. The will has power indeed for evil, but not for good, except as helped by the infinite good. Original sin is the basis of predestinating election. The whole human mass was so justly condemned in the apostate root that when none rescued from that damnation, none could blame God's justice. And I was just saying that. If God said to you, well, you know, some people say, you know, well, God's not fair uh, to send some people to hell. Well, you know, if God was fair, we'd all go to hell. So it's, uh, those, those who are rescued are rescued gratuitous, gratuitously uh, and by, by, by no merit of their own. Uh, those who are not only show the whole lump, even the rescued themselves deserved, had not undeserved mercy helped them. So if without this uh, uh, election, without this irresistible grace, without this limited atonement, we, we, we wouldn't deserve anything. Uh, and we don't deserve it, you know. If the will of man turns to good, that is due to gracious divine efficiency. Man's regeneration is entirely the work of grace. Grace is efficacious and irresistible. I like this guy here. Its action on the soul is the result of direct divine agency. Only those predestinated to eternal life are regenerated. They are also endowed with the gift of perseverance. Grace is indefectible. Uh, they are the elect. The elect are few in comparison with the non-elect, a doctrine attributed to scripture and confirmed by observation. Yet the latter are somehow created for the benefit of the former. Election is not grounded on foreknowledge of human faith and conduct. No account is given as to why some are elected and others not. There must be two classes to manifest the divine mercy and justice. Over the mass of corruption, there passed two acts of the will of God. The act of favor and grace, choose in part to be partakers of everlasting glory, and an act of justice, forsaking the rest and judging them to endless perdition. These vessels of wrath and those of mercy. So you got vessels of wrath and vessels of mercy. And that's all through the Bible. To, to, to deny that there's vessels of wrath uh, preordained uh, uh, for, for hell and vessels of mastery, uh, vessels of mercy uh, predestined uh, to heaven is just to be antichrist. It's just to deny what's in the Bible. No matter how many verses you can find that, and he wants all men to be saved. You know, he doesn't want all. Uh, he wants the, all the elect to be saved. Um, but there are vessels of wrath and vessels of mercy. Uh, there was no positive and efficient decree of any to eternal death. The decree of God was simply to leave the wicked in the state of perdition to which they had come. And then Augustine uh, teaches uh, preterition. I don't know what that was all about. Uh, Aquinas, who looked upon merit in the strict sense of the term as the effect of grace, and graced the effect of predestination. I like that. Uh, Aquinas, who looked upon merit in the strict sense of the term as the effect of grace, and grace as the effect of predestination. And that's a little bit, you know, this, uh, I read a bunch of pages in this, in this uh, the Hastings, uh, in, in under elections. So if you have Hastings, you, you look under election, and it's right there. You know, uh, there's, there's no... No mystery here about what we're looking at here. You know, some of these guys are good. Some of these guys hit the nail right on the head, you know. Uh, and other guys, you gotta you gotta exegete and then take some stuff out uh, because some of them are crazy. And 
and, and so by studying and, and, and knowing uh, the truth that, that we get to uh, get to understand that. So uh, grace is um, I've got something I wrote down here. Irresistible grace. Let me see. Uh, a, a grace from God which cannot be refused. OK, so that's irresistible grace. The grace from God, which cannot be refused. Uh, it also cannot be earned. It's a gift. It's unmerited favor. Uh, it's an unmerited gift. And since we are totally depraved and there is no good in us except Jesus, God has to chose out of people through unconditional election. Uh, only those elected receive the limited atonement. You know, so which came first, you know, or, or is it all simultaneous? I think it's all simultaneous for the most part. But you, you got to understand that totally depraved has to be up there first you know so this grace has to come to us from god uh to affect our election so we can repent and receive the atonement so in this in my mind this is how i'm working it out you know the grace has to come uh, to to affect our election and then we repent and then we get the atonement so and then uh what's his name augustine was very good on this he says uh, uh everyone who is saved owes his salvation entirely to divine grace without any meritorious cooperation of his own that's a good quote <laughs> everyone who is saved owes his salvation entirely to divine grace without any meritorious cooperation of his own so we don't do nothing here except try to lead a good life you know and I got a question was Adam originally immortal that's another thing they argue about I'm not going to get into that right now. Uh, or would he have died whether he sinned or not? So the uh, talking about the uh, the condition of, of the original man, you know, was he supposed to live forever without dying? And, and did he die only because, you know, and you got to go back and forth with that. I don't know what the answer is to that. <laughs> but uh, you could argue that he was originally supposed to be immortal and then and, and he, he messed it up by sinning. And, and the wages of sin is death, you know, so. But God knew he was going to sin anyway. You know, why else would he put the, the garden, the tree in the middle of the garden? You know, he didn't say if you eat from it. He says when you eat from it, you're going to die. So, so man was corrupt uh, before Adam's sin. He was corrupt. Um, he was made from from corrupt dust, and we know. Uh, uh, I talked about it before. Gen Revelation twelve nine happened between Genesis one one and Genesis one two, and then uh, Job fifteen fifteen says that. The heavens are not clean in his sight. So <laughs> that it also uh, happened because of, of Satan's fall. Nothing is clean. Um, and, and then uh, let me get into a bunch of verses. Something else I wanted to read, but um, it, it, it is the original sin that brought death. All right. So, you know, we had this sin and then, then death had to follow after that. Uh, Genesis uh 217. Let me see if I got a page. I'm throwing up some verses here, but yeah, it's 217. Give the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. In the day that thou eatest of it, thou shalt surely die. So he didn't say if, he says you will. Uh, but man was corrupt. Uh, he was a corrupt being made from the corrupt day dust. Um, and I got the Calvinism uh, in McClinic and Strong. Uh, let me just get through something if I could do this quickly. Uh, I can't because there's a, there's a lot of different um, definitions in here that I came across that I thought were interesting. Uh, let me see if I got them here. This one, sublipsarian and an infralipsarian. I, I really don't want to get into it, but if I if I mention these things, you, you know that they're in McClinic and Strong, and you can look them up. But uh, just to say uh, what what we what we are here, uh, you got sublapsarian and infralapsarian. I can give you the de definitions real quick. Um, it, it, it's even over here. Uh, hold on a second. All right, this is latitudinarianism. All right, that's uh, toleration. But this um, sub <coughs> lapsarian, <coughs> sub lapsarian. 
I A N. Uh, it's not going to happen here. Hold on a second. Let's sub. Let's uh, All right, it's not happening here. I had it up there before. So, but and, and you also have infra lapsarianism, but we're neither one of these. We are it's what we call supra lapsarianism. So this definition of infra lapsarianism is the doctrine that God foresaw and permitted the fall of man, and that after the fall he then decreed election as a means of saving some of the human race. Now, you, some you might read that and say, well, that makes sense. But then you got supra lapsarianism, uh, which is what I believe and, and what, what Calvin believed. He says the doctrine that God decreed both election and reprobation prior to creation. So as you can see, the other one was after the fall. But this is this is something that was in the mind of God before, you know, they were even born. He talks about uh, Esau and Jacob, you know, uh, the elder shall serve the younger. And I hated one and loved the other before they were born. So the, the doctrine that God decreed both election and probation prior to creation and then allowed the fall of man as a means of carrying out his divine purposes. That's the, the best uh, definition right there. So that's supra lapsarianism. And that's, uh, I can't get this sub though. Let me see, sub lapsarian, S-U-B. It's not popping up. Okay, so forget about it. Uh, but I think I had it written down here. Hold on, sublapsarianism. Uh, yes, I do have it on my notes here. Um, it, it, it election is dependent on that which uh, permitted the introduction of evil. So I'm not even going to get into that. You know, uh, so forget about infralapsarianism and forget about sublapsarianism. We're going with the uh, supra, supra lapsarianism, the doctrine that God decreed both election and ends reprobation prior to creation and then allowed the fall of man as a means of carrying out his divine uh, purposes. So that's what makes sense to me. <coughs> so that's that. Um, and what else was I looking at here? Remonstrance. I didn't look at that. Uh, Irresistible grace. We'll read a little bit of that. There's not much on that, but this here in, in the one in, in Calvin here, uh, uh, Calvinism. Um, do I have Calvinism? Yes, I do have Calvinism, but I, it's a different page here. Uh, in, 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 in the McLean and Strong, it's, it's volume two, and it starts on page 42. So I don't know what this is because this is 134. So let me put. Um, Calvin's own view. Here we go. Yeah, Calvin's own views, super lapsarian, that, be, that before set forth um, under the article Calvin, we give here simply such farther extracts from Calvin's own writings as are necessary to show his system. Uh, predestination by which God adopts some to the hope of life and adjures others to eternal death. Uh, but that's really, uh, that's that's reprobation. <clears throat> You're not predestinated, you know, um, you are uh, foreordained or preordained for hell, but predestination we know is a righteous word. Uh, so no one desirous of the credit of piety dares absolutely to deny. Uh, but it is involved in many cavils, especially uh, to those who make foreknowledge the cause of it. We We maintain that both belong to God, but it is preposterous to present one as dependent on the other. Predestination we call the eternal decree of God in which he hath determined in himself that he would have to become what, what, what would have to become of every individual of mankind, for they are not all created with a similar destiny, but eternal life is foreordained for some and eternal damnation for others. Every man, therefore, being created for one or the other of these ends, we say he is predestinated either to life or death, uh, but we know he's not predestinated uh, for because uh, that's pro horizo. It's it's, it's free bound. Um, uh, after having spoken of the election of the race of Abraham and then a particular branches of that race, he proceeds. 
Though it is sufficiently clear that God in his secret counsel freely chooses whom he will and rejects others, his gratuitous election is but half displayed till we come to particular individuals to whom God not only offers salvation, but assigns it in such a manner that the certainty of the effect is liable to no suspense or doubt. So he goes on. <clears throat> I'm going to read all of this here. Hold on a second. Be affirm. Yeah, I got all of this down here. Hold on a second. Uh, um, no doubt. Uh, he sums up the chapter in which he thus uh, generally states the doctrine in these words. In conformity, therefore, uh, to the clear doctrine of the scripture, we assert that by an eternal and immutable counsel, God hath uh, once for all determined both whom he would admit to salvation and whom he would condemn to destruction. We affirm that this counsel, as far as concerns the elect, is founded on his gratuitous mercy, totally irrespective of human merit, but that to those whom he devotes to condemnation, the gate of life is closed by a just and irreprehensible, uh, irreprehensible, but incomprehensible judgment. You know, we're, we're, we're sitting here thinking to ourselves, you know, if I was God, would I do this? <laughs> Probably not. You know, if I was God, I'd let everybody in, but uh, I'm not, and I can't understand. So that's why it's, uh, it's incomprehensible judgment. I can't understand it. Uh, and the elect, we, but it's his will. It's what he wants to do. And then why is he doing it? Uh, he'll tell you so many times in the Bible, it's because he wants to. Uh, and the elect, and we, we can understand his reasons. We're here in this finite world. You know, we're in these bodies. Uh, we're in the two dimensions, whatever it is. I don't know what dimension he's in. Uh, he's out there, man. <laughs> in the elect, we consider calling as an evidence of election and justification as another token of its manifestation till they arrive in glory, which constitutes its completion. So there you go. Uh, and as God seals his elect by vocation and justification, so by excluding the rest, from the knowledge of his name and sanctification of his spirit, he affords other indication of the judgments that awaits them. So that's it. They have no knowledge of his name. I mean, I, that's that's hell is knowing that the God exists and uh, you're never going to see him or hear from him again. And gratuitous mercy, totally irrespective of human merit. I like that. And then um, I can read all this, but uh, I got something written uh, on the line. I got consistently with this. Let me get down to that. But I can read all of that consistently. Where is it? Here it is. Consistently with this, he a little further on asserts that election does not flow from holiness, but holiness from election. And that's good. I like that. I'm holy because of, of election, you know, uh, election doesn't flow from holiness. Uh, it's not that I'm holy, so he made, made me elect. No, I'm elect, and then I better get holy. <laughs> That's what that means. Uh, for, one, for when it is said that the faithful are elected that they should be holy, it is fully implied that the holiness they were in future to possess had its origin in election. So he just said it better than I did. Uh, he proceeds to quote the example of Jacob. And he saw as loved and hated before they had done good or evil to show that the only reason of election and reprobation is to be placed in God's secret counsel. Whatever that is, that's his secret counsel. And that's in uh, in Romans 9, what is it, 918? Romans 9.18. Well, hopefully I get into the Romans 5 and maybe some Ephesians about the grace uh but i wanted to look this because i got it written in the volume over here hold on a second romans 9 18. okay therefore he had mercy on whom he will have mercy and whom he harden it he hardens uh and this mercy is uh l-u-o yeah l-u-o uh, and that that also is connected with grace too so we'll, we'll we'll dance around some of the mercy and and the grace uh words if we get a chance uh, but there's a lot of good stuff in here. Uh, and I, you just look up Calvinism uh, in, in your uh, McClinic and Strong. Uh, let me see what else I got here. It goes down to, um, where was I here? I think this was it. Uh, three, uh, 
five from the above passages. Hold on a second. Yeah, all right, here we go. Let me read this. I got this on the line in the book. I can't read all of everything, you know. From the above passages, it will be seen that Calvin went beyond the Augustinian. These guys were in cahoots too, you know, that they, they, they believed the same thing. Uh, Calvin went beyond the Augustinian theory of predestination and held to the sublapsarian view, uh, which which I kind of hold, hold to, you know, it makes sense to me. Sublapsarianism regards man before the fall as the object of unconditional decree of salvation or damnation. Uh, that's, um, excuse me, supralapsarianism. Uh, but this sublapsarianism, on the other hand, makes the decree subordinate to the creation and fall of man. So the sublaps uh, say all of this happened after uh, the fall of man. Uh, the supralapse say everything happened before, you know, before we were even made from the corrupt dust. So, and that, that makes sense, you know, from everything we know about scripture, uh, the, the supralapsarianism uh, view is, is, is the one. Um, uh, uh, Superlapsarium super holds that the decree to eternal bliss or woe precedes in order, in the order of nature, the decree to apostasy. Infralapsarianism holds that it succeeds it, and we don't believe that. So we uh, uh, we believe the supra. The superlapsarium hold that God decreed the fall of Adam. The sublapsarians that He permitted it. Well, we we know He permitted it, but He also decreed it. So, so the subs don't, don't believe that he decreed it. They just believe that he permitted it. But the supra laps uh, believe that everything happened uh, before the foundation of the world. So, some writers have named that Calvin was not a superlapsarian, but that view of his teaching is hardly tenable, and he, he was. Uh, Calvin terms the exclusion of the fall of the first man from the divine predestination. Uh, he goes on to. To do, to get, there's a lot of Latin. I wish I knew Latin. Um, it is on this particular point that Calvin goes further than Augustine, who did not include the fall of Adam in the divine decree. So these guys, you know, they're only off by a little bit here, a little doctrine there, but they, they basically believe the same stuff. It's just that, you know, when, when things happened and, uh, and why they happened, they, they kind of like disagree. And, um, you know, this is... Uh, I don't agree with everything, you know, that, that Jim says. There's a couple of things we, I butted head with him, you know, but uh, it doesn't mean I'm a vessel of wrath. It doesn't mean that he's a vessel of wrath, you know. Uh, um, let me see what we got here. What else did I have on the line here? Super uh, Doctrine of But election two, Doctrines of Dort. Okay, the Doctrines of Dort. And they had a, a synod in of Dort. So you'd have to look that up. And you could just bounce around these books uh, forever of predestination uh, all men have sinned in Adam and have been be, become exposed to the curse of the eternal death God would have done no injustice to anyone if he had determined to leave the whole human race unto sin and the curse and to condemn them on account of sin according to those words of the apostle all the world has become guilty before God Romans 3 19 23 and Romans 6 2 uh, that some in time have faith given them by God and others have it not given proceeds from the eternal decree for known unto God are all his works from the beginning, etc., etc. Acts 15, 18. It's one of the words, one of the, 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 the scriptures I wrote down here in Ephesians 1, 11. Uh, according to uh, which decree he graciously softens the heart of the elect, however hard, and he bends the them to believe, but the non-elect he leaves in his judgment to their own perversity and hardness. So if he leaves you alone, you're in trouble. Uh, if he beats you up, God bless you. Uh, and here especially a deep discrimination at the same time, both merciful and just, a discrimination of men equally lost opens itself to us, or that, that decree of election and reprobation, which is revealed in the word of God, which as perverse, impure, and unstable persons do rest their own destruction. And as he's quoting a, a Bible verse right there. So it affords ineffable consolation to holy and pious soul, souls. But election is the immutable 
It's unchangeable purpose of God by which before the foundations of the world were laid. I love it. He chose out of the whole human race fallen by their own effort from their primal, primeval integrity into sin and destruction according to the most free good pleasure of his own will and of mere grace a certain number of men neither better nor worthier than others but lying in the same misery with the rest the salvation in Christ whom he had even from eternity constituted mediator and head of all the elect and the foundation of salvation and therefore he decreed to give to him to be saved and effectually to call and draw them into communion with him by his word and spirit or he decreed himself to give unto them true faith to justify to sanctify and at length powerfully to glorify them etc and we got all these verses here we can go through a lot of this stuff uh we went through a lot of the uh, elect he had chosen us uh not because we were right uh, but that we might be holy uh, ephesians 1 4 we went into we got into a lot of these uh, elect verses uh, last week uh, but election is the immutable purpose and what else uh, uh, that's good I got a lot of stuff there but there's still so much uh, in here when you read uh, Calvin John Calvin Calvinism and Calvinists you'll get into that and you'll see uh, um, what that is and it's irresistible grace this is a short thing here he says as already stated in the article of grace, the word grace is the hinge of three great theological controversies. One of these on the nature of depravity and regeneration between the orthodox doctrine of church and Pelagianism, and you don't have to look that up, I can't explain it to you right now, comprehends the question of irresistible grace. Some of the followers of Augustine in their attempt to oppose Pelagianism uh, says of the Church of England and himself, a believer in predestination, carry their views of absolute predestination of a limited number to the ultimate attainment of salvation through the influence of the irresistible grace of God, causing their final perseverance, that's great, to, to such an extreme in their logical deductions that there appeared persons who charged the August. Augustinian system with leading to the dangerous conclusions that human actions are immaterial and some people took it that far they said well you know then we have we don't have to do anything you know that's that's fatalism uh, and human efforts for the conversion of the wicked unavailing so but you know that if you're wicked you're wicked you, there's nothing anybody can do uh, if you're a goat you're a goat and if you're a sheep you're a sheep there's nothing you can do uh, in the face of God's free gift of grace and according with his secret decrees predetermined from everlasting and for the Arminian argument uh, which is the opposite of, of August Augustine and, and Calvin, we can go to, to look at Arminianism uh, predestination he will so, so we'll do that that was real quick with that one and then we got the subs and the laps and the infras and a remonstrance I didn't even bother reading this this, uh, this is what they, they called the Arminians um, so I think we can, yeah, I can't read all that. Okay. So um, let me see, there was something else I had here. Um, let me just get back to my notes here. Uh, the internet sublapse, uh, grace is needed because of our total depravity. Without grace, we all go to hell. Uh, that would be the, the fairest outcome. Uh, thank God he has chosen or elected a few to the limited atonement uh, and this will cause the elect to persevere and uh, you are either elect or reprobate from the foundation of the world you one or the other uh, first peter one first peter one always like to get into verses just to let you know that you know we're uh, we study the word here yeah. we don't just go crazy reading history and biographies and things like that but uh, that's needed we got to put things in context first peter one one and two yeah. Uh, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. You got elect. Eclectos, according to the what? The foreknowledge of God, the prognosis. God, 
prearrangement. Uh, grace be multiplied. Charis. So that's the grace. And it is irresistible. In First Peter 2, 7 and 8, talking about you're one or the other. And delivered just a lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. Without right just man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous law from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. So that's it. You're, you're one or the other. And then um, he, he, where was I going with this? Hold on a second. I got some words here. Let me, let me get my theological word book here. But there's a lot of good verses here. We'll, we'll run, run across them uh, in, in the theological word book. But let me just give you a couple here that we got. We know that uh, grace, when the, the first first verse you see it in the Bible is Genesis 6. Genesis 6, 8. Always play around to see when, when the first time the word is, is mentioned. For just about every word I look at, I want to see where, it, where it's first mentioned. Genesis 6, 8. Noah found grace. In the eyes of the Lord, that's the first place it's, it's mentioned. And that's 2580. And that's Ken. And it comes from this other one here, which is Canaan. And there's another one here. What's the number? Uh, 8467. Hold on a second. Oh, favor. Canaan. And it's Tech. Tech and all. These three all go together, and that's TWOT uh, 694. So we'll play around with this and uh, see what we get. But there's some other verses here. Hold on a second. And also, uh, Joseph, he showed uh, grace to actually to Moses after this. Uh, um, oh, did I leave that there? Okay, let me, let me get this out of here. Hold on a second. Sorry. Uh, What happened? There we go. Genesis. Uh, no, Exodus. No, let me do Joseph. Genesis 39. He showed favor. Genesis 39. Elected. We got two verses. We got four and 21. Four. And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him, and he made him overseer. And all they had put into his hand, talking about uh, part of his household. And then uh, down in 21, Joseph gets more grace here. Uh, and Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound. And he was in the prison. And But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. So there's the words here. We got mercy and favor. Hold on a second. 21. We got mercy, which is uh, Kased. Um, I didn't. Um, I didn't look at this. Hold on a second. Mercy, Kased, Chasid, Chasid, Kased. Uh, yeah, that's why I didn't look at it. It's, there's not too many verses. This is all some kind of history thing here. Um, yeah, okay. Abram's willingness to send Rebecca and Isaac. Yeah, that's the one. Okay, forget about that. Yeah, and uh, favor. Here it is. Favor. Ken. Cain. That's the grace. And we'll look at this uh, TWOT here. Um, all right, favor. But there's some other verses here that I wanted to get into. To uh, not everyone of uh, uh, Exodus 32, oh, 3319. It's uh, uh, 3319. It's got a couple of words in there. 3319. I ran, ran across this a couple of times with a couple of different words. I'll show them to you here quick. We'll probably run into it again. Um, and he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will pro proclaim the name of the Lord. 
before thee and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, Canaan, and will have, have mercy, Rakam. So we'll look at these two. These are the two we're going to be looking at Rakam and Ken, or Canaan. And that's uh, TWT 694, and the other one is TWT 2146. I got it here somewhere. 694. Where's the other one? I had it here somewhere. I'll have to put it up again. Here it is, 2146. Okay, so let's do this one first. Yeah, this, uh, this one here. All right. If I have anything on the line here, because uh, I could just read the whole thing, but I have some stuff that's on the line. Uh, so, and we know what the definition is, you know, uh, to grant favor, uh, to be gracious, to favor, to feel sympathy, compassion. Um, the verb uh, Hanan depicts a heartfelt response by someone who has something to give to one who has a need. Uh, App Thomas's suggestion that the verb comes from the bilateral root to bend, or to incline. That is uh, to condescend is not convincing. Why would they even say that? Why would you even bring that up? Uh, it sounds like you just want to put somebody down for the sake of putting them down. It's just to, in order to quote something and then say it's not convincing. Why, why even bother putting that in there? That's what some of these guys are saying. According to Flack, the verb describes an action from a superior to an inferior who has no real claim for gracious treatment. And as you go, there's your definition of grace right there. An action from a superior to an inferior who has no real claim uh, to gracious treatments. Um, and then they give you some of the uh, uh, Septuagint words. Oikterio is that uh, 3627. Let me put it up there real quick. 3627. Oh, if you Septuagint, you'll see this compassion, uh, oikterio, uh, have compassion, to have pity on, have compassion, oikterio, surprise, there's only one time there, well, and then you have uh, L-U-O, which we just looked at, I think, L-U-O, 1656, L-U-O, and that's mercy, all right, put these two up there real quick here. So you see him. So Elios is mercy, and Oiktiro is to have compassion. And uh, we, we might run into some of these words too. And there's another one here uh, to supplicate, uh, deesis, you know, the word for deesis. Uh, it often has a sense of showing kindness to the poor and needy. And then uh, the psalmist asked Yahweh, hold on a second, the overwhelming number. Uh, the overwhelming number of uses in the Kaos time, some 41 instances, have Yahweh as the subject. The plea, Hanani, to be gracious unto me, appears 19 times in the Psalms. The Psalms ask Yahweh to show him favor in view of his loneliness, his distress, and his transgression. So look at this transgression one here in Psalms 51.1. He says, uh, to the chief musician, a Psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet came unto him after he had gone into Bathsheba, and we know that story, have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgression. So uh, even though I'm a dirty, rotten, lousy, no good sinner, please have mercy on me. And this is repentance. Uh, have mercy. Canaan, uh, according to thy loving, loving kindness, with tender mercies. And that's Rakam. So these are the two words we're looking at. Rakam and uh, somebody keeps popping in here. I don't know what that is. Anyway. So, uh, 33.19, that's uh, 51. And then, of course, uh, we looked at 33.19 already. But yeah, let's, let's just, uh, uh, and in Amos 5.15, he urges his hearers to establish uh, justice uh, that the Lord might be gracious to them. In the final analysis, the Lord is sovereign and he's acting graciously to those whom he selects. And that's the 3319. 
uh, but gracious and whom I be gracious and show mercy to whom I show mercy. And uh, he, he drowned the uh, Pharaoh in the in the sea. He hardened his heart. Uh, the hit of use. Okay, let me listen to something else. I got underlined here. The vast majority of uh, occurrences are secular and not theological. Yeah, the vast majority. Here we go. The vast majority of occurrences are secular and not theological in significance. In contrast with the verb Hanan, the focus of attention is not on the giver, but on the recipient of what is given. In contrast with the frequent occurrences of the verb and other derivatives, in the Psalms, hen or ken occurs but twice, 84, 11. Uh, the Lord God is a, is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. And the other one is uh, 45 and 2. He says, Thou art fairer than the children of men. Grace is poured into thy lips. Therefore, God hath blessed thee forever. Uh, and this other guy's got something here, uh, Neubauer. As Neubauer has stressed, many of the passages in which this phrase is found concerning relations of a superior to an inferior uh, king to his subject, but it is too much to hold that the phrase is a terminus technicus, whatever that means, a, a technical term, so that Jacob in uh, Genesis 32 5, uh, and I have oct and an asses, flocks, and men servants and women servants that I have sent to tell my Lord that I may find grace in thy sight. So he's he's going, he's he's doing all this. Uh, and Jacob is doing this to Esau. So uh, you know, it, it, it isn't so much as a superior to an inferior. I mean, you can say Jacob is superior to Esau, even though right now Esau holds the power. You know, he could kill him if he wants uh, for what he did to him. You know some uh, uh 20 30 years ago 20 years ago you know but um and genesis, genesis 33 and 8 um talking to esau saying you know what do you what do you mean by all of this what are you trying to do he's just trying to appease esau uh so let me find grace he says and he's and, and, he, and esau said let me now leave with these some of the folk that are with me and he said what needed it let me find grace in the sight of my Lord. So here's uh, Jacob asking Esau for grace. So it's not so much uh, uh, a superior to an inferior or an inferior. You know, the inferior isn't getting the grace uh, from the superior there. And what else do I have on the line? Uh, we already read about Noah and Moses. Yes, we did that already. Okay. Uh, yes, we did that. Okay. That's good. All right. So that was a quickie on the TWOT uh, 694. And the other one, 2146. I think I had it here somewhere. 2146. Uh, uh, there it is. Okay. And I got some of these verses here already, so that's good. Uh, where does it start here? 2146. Let me get to the page. See what I have on the line. Because I can't read everything to you every day. Uh, the root is frequently used of God. Let's go to this. The root is frequently used of God. Hold on a second. Is it the church? All the way up, all the way here. Nope, that's not it. Here it is. The, the root is frequently used of God. It incorporates two concepts. First, the strong tie God has with those whom he has called as his children. Psalms 103.13, he says, Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. So there you go. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom there. So... Uh, you can't stress this fear of the Lord enough. Uh, fear him. Yare. Uh, also means the a reverent, a reverent fearing. So he pitieth. And um, did we look at the word already? Rakam. Yeah, rakam. Mercy, compassion. 
Oh, let's put that up there. We'll close this. And we look at 3319 already. Uh, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I'll be gracious to whom I am gracious. Uh, so God looks upon his own as a father looks upon his children. He has pity on them. And this is the wrong verse here, Micah 717. It is not. It is Micah 719. Let me uh, take this out of here. Uh, Micah 719. Is that right? Yeah, let me go. 719. He says, he will turn again, he will have compassion upon us, he will subdue our iniquities, and thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. So it's like it never happened. Compassion. Uh, Rakam, mercy, grace. All right, so we got that TWOT 2146, cross this 717 out and put 719 in there. Uh, the second concept is that of God's un conditioned choice Canaan or grace so we just look at Canaan already so they got it in here God tells Moses that he is gracious and merciful to to whomsoever he chooses and how many times are we going to look at this verse Exodus 33 19. all right there are several ideas attached to God's deep and the love first the unconditional election of God there is again next his mercy and forgiveness toward his people in the face of deserved judgment and upon the condition of their repentance. Deuteronomy 13, 7, and they shall cleave naught of the cursed thing to thine hand that the Lord may turn from the fierceness of his anger and show thee mercy and have compassion on thee and multiply thee as he has sworn unto thy fathers, even though you don't deserve it. So this is what we heard in here. Compassion, real calm. Also, God's continuing mercy and grace in preserving his unrepentant people from judgment. Second Kings 13, 23. And the Lord was gracious unto them and had compassion on them and had respect unto them because of his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And would not destroy them, neither cast he them from their present as yet. <laughs> as yet, but you know he will. All right. Uh, thus, uh, this attributed, uh, this attribute becomes the basis in part of an eschatological hope. And you got all these verses here. Uh, Isaiah 14, 1, for the Lord will have mercy on Jacob and will yet choose Israel. Let's choose there. Hold on a second. And choose. There's when we look at that last week. That's the Bakar. Yeah, that's Bakar. Choose. For the Lord will have mercy on Jacob and Israel and set them in their own land and the strangers shall be joined with them and they shall cleave to the house of Jacob. Sing, O heavens, and be joyful, O earth, Psalms, uh, Isaiah 49, 13, and break forth into singing, O mountains, for the Lord hath comforted his people and will have mercy upon his afflicted. Isaiah 54, 7, for a small moment have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. So he's he's telling them, you know, uh, I'm going to destroy uh, you guys, but I'm going to leave a remnant. Uh, so, so this is a small moment where you're going to be forsaken, but he will gather us uh, with mercies, with grace. Jeremiah 12, 15, and it shall come to pass after that I have plucked them out, I will return and have compassion on them. And this, this is Jeremiah now he's talking to uh, when he's talking about uh, Jerusalem. And I will bring them again, and every man to his heritage, and every man to his land. And uh, Jeremiah 33, 26, then will I cast away the seed of Jacob and David, my servant, so that I will not take any of his seed to be rules over the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, for I will cause their captivity to return and have mercy on them. So he's going to have mercy. And Ezekiel 34. Oops. 3425. And I will make with them a covenant of peace and will cause the evil beasts to cease out of the land and they shall dwell safely in the wilderness 
and sleep in the woods. And Micah 719, we read, he will turn again and will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities. And that will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea like they didn't even exist. In Zechariah 116, therefore, thus saith the Lord, I am returned to Jerusalem with mercies. My house shall be built in it. And uh, saith the Lord of hosts, and a line shall be stretched forth upon Jerusalem. So this is when they came back from the from the captivity there. And what else do I have uh, on the line here? Uh, nine seventeen. Okay, nine seventeen. Uh, therefore, the Lord shall have no joy in their young men, neither shall have mercy on their fathers and widows. For everyone is a hypocrite and an evildoer, and every mouth speaketh folly. For all this is anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. So this is talking about uh, against uh, harsh judgment at the hands of Babylon. And Isaiah 27, 11. So there's no mercy there. <laughs> But he's going to have mercy after that. Um, 27, 11. When the boughs thereof are withered, they shall be broken off. The woman come and set them afire. For it is a people of no understanding. Therefore, he that made them will have not mercy. So this is him talking about him not having mercy on his children. And uh, this is before he uh, destroyed them, you know, the, the first time with the Assyrians and, and then the second time with the uh, Babylonians. So here he's talking about Ephraim. I will not have mercy. Mercy upon our children, for they are children of hooligans. Uh, more than Israel. And what else? I had something else here. What was it? Was it 223. 223. All right. The restitution of the father son relationship and the return of the exile witnesses, this accompanying loving care. Uh, Hosea 223, and I will sow her unto me in the earth, and I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy, and I will say to them which are not my people, thou art my people, and they shall say, thou art my God. So that's good. Um, scriptures make it clear, make it certain that the exile was brought by God and terminated by God. Okay, I thank you for that. Uh, therefore, thus say the Lord God, now will I bring again the captivity of Jacob. And have mercy upon the whole house of Israel and will be jealous for my holy name. So I used to think bring again the captivity meant he was going to put them back into captivity, but it bring it means he's going to bring them out of captivity. When he says, I bring again the captivity of Jacob, it means he's going to set them free. Okay. Uh finally the prophet's message regarding the return of the exile opens onto a permanent state with a father-son relationship will never be broken. We saw that. Uh, 54, 8, and 10. Uh, and a little wrath, I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy Redeemer. Uh, for this is as the waters of Noah unto me, for as I have sworn that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth, so have I sworn that I would not be wrought with thee. For the mountains shall depart, and the hills be removed, and my kindness shall not depart from thee, neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, saith the Lord that had mercy on thee. So it's his mercy, and we don't deserve it. We deserve nothing of the sort. Let's see what I got here. Later on, we have another one, 39, 16. Oh, that came from the tree of knowledge and good and evil. Okay. Just really die. And this is the grace. Uh, yeah, well, I wanted to get into Romans. Um... Let me see. Hold on a second. There's still some verses I wanted to look at here. Hold on a second. Excuse me. Romans 11, 5 and 7. Romans 11, 5 to 7. Talking about election, he says, uh, even so it then at, at this present time, also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Two of the words right there, are election and grace. And if by grace, then it is no more works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be works, then it is no more grace. <laughs> Otherwise, work is no more work. What then? 
Israel had not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election had obtained it, and the rest were blinded. I read the whole thing here. Um, according as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this day. Um, and David said, let their table be made a snare, and a trap, and a stumbling block, and a recompense unto them. Uh, something else about grace in here. Uh, but the whole thing is it's, it's about them being grafted in again, and, that, and that's grace. Uh, and then we read the Peter, the whole, Ephesians 2. There was something else. I wanted to get into Romans Romans 5, but that's a big one there. Yeah. Romans, uh, but this Ephesians uh, 2, uh, 4 and 5. Ephesians 2, 4 and 5. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved this, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together by Christ, by grace, are ye saved. So that's it. Uh, and he raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of the grace, of his grace and his kindness toward us through Jesus Christ. For uh, by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. There's a definition right there. Yeah. Not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God had before ordained that should, we should walk, walk in them. And then to, uh, 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 1 9. Uh, 2 Timothy 1 9. Uh, who hath saved us and called us with his holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. So he called us, what's this called here? Kaleo, okay, by the calling, a holy calling, kalesis, vocation. Kalesis, so two callings here, not works, but according to the grace. Charis, which was given us in Christ Jesus when supralapsarianism before the foundation, before the world began. Supralapsarianism. Uh, Titus three. So that you, that you can write next to that supralapsarianism. <laughs> Titus, Titus three, four and five. Four or five here. He says, but afterwards, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, because we haven't, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according According to the hope of eternal life. You got a whole bunch of good words. And there you got heirs, uh, washing of regeneration, renewing. I think I look at these words. Washing of regeneration. The washing, that's the, uh, the yeah, the lutron and the luo. Yeah, that's to wash, to bathe. And regeneration is palingenesia. Paling is again. Uh, palin is again. And Genesia is Genesis, palingenesis. So watch, it's, a, it's a being born again. And palingenesia is regeneration or a new birth. Uh, and renewing. Uh, anakinosis comes from Anna and Kino. Uh, Anna means by or into the midst of. And Kino, Kinos, which is new. So it's a new. Washing mm. and then um, 27. We look at that. We look at that. Yeah, we look at that. Okay, we look at these words. See, uh, and then uh, Romans five. Let me just run into this here. Romans five. <laughs> Therefore, <clears throat> being justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith 
into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given to us. And that's the truth. For one, we were yet without strength. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. That's all of us there. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare die. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And that reconciled here is uh, uh, catalasso. Catalasso, change from reconciled. Oh, let me get that word in there. And um, and not only so, but we also join God through our Lord Jesus Christ, for whom we have now received tada, atonement. Uh, 26 to 43, that's katalage. So you got reconciliation, katalaso, and the, and the katalage is the reconciliation or the atonement. So the grace and then atonement, right? So that, that that's the order of that. Um, and sometimes uh, I get confused as to where, which came first, you know. But we know total depravity comes first, but everything else after that, kind of like uh, you can fit it in somewhere. But this uh, atonement comes after the election and after the grace. But, you know, like I said, it all comes all at the same time. Because why? Because he knew it before the foundation of the world, what was going to happen. So it's all one doctrine. It's not five separate points of, of Calvinism, you know. Uh, it's not five little tulips here. It's it's one doctrine um, of, of what God did for us, you know, before the foundation of the world. He knew all this was going to happen. Uh, so, and he says, as wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world and death by sin. So there, there is no death in, until there's sin. And, and once there is sin, then then death came. And so death passed upon all men, and that's the original sin, for that all have sinned. And this whole thing is in parentheses here uh, up until 18. You, so you can go from verse 12 and read 18, and it, it would make sense. He says, wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for all sinned, and you can go, therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came. But we're going to read the whole thing anyway. So somebody just stuck this in here. Uh, for, for that all have sinned. For until the law, uh, this is talking about uh, between that, what happened between Adam and Moses. Because the, the law didn't get here until Moses came down from the mountain. So from Adam to Moses, what's happening to all these people? Okay. Nevertheless, it's here. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed. When there is no law. Uh, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come, which is Christ. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. And that's grace. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, have abounded unto many, and not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, uh, Adam, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense, Adam, death reigned in sin, much more, much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. He's given you a, a whole definition of what grace is right here in this chapter. He says, for as by one 
commands disobedience, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ. And that's irresistible grace right there. I mean, you can't get away from it. That is irresistible grace. And uh, there was something else I had here. Which was it? Well, I had a... I had a post it in here, but it must have fell out, so I don't know what it was. Something in volume two. Hold on a second. Ah, shut up. Uh, I couldn't even tell you what word I was looking at here. In volume two. L-U- oh, it's probably, no, it's not that. Eleutheros. Exusia. Episcope. It was probably something else here. Euangelizo, Eudokeo, Eulogeo. All good words, but the uh, echo, echo, they all. I don't know. Anyway, whatever I had up there, it's gone. It'll come back one day, I'm sure. I'll put that over there. So that's it, man. As far as I got on my notes and all the stuff. I was supposed to read. Oh, and it's early yet. So I gave you all these words. You got the words. I don't know who that is. 2603. That's the Kana. That's the mercy. That's the verb. And then the, uh, which one is the verb here? And the charis. That's. Uh, 5483. So these go together. 5483. That's the charis. There's the verb there. Charizomai. So I'm good. We got that. That's one well verse. I just wanted to get the uh, Romans 5 because I think that 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 like wraps it up. You know, uh, Romans 5 is a perfect uh, chapter for that. Anyway, so let me just stop here. Because you know, anything else is just uh, just coming out of my own mouth, you know, and uh, I'm not uh, I'm not too good at that. Well, sometimes I am, but uh, most of the time I'm not. So I'll just stop uh, here. We'll take a moment of silence and uh, thank you, God, for bringing us together. You know, uh, we do this one day at a time. We got all this stuff we're looking at. Uh, your grace, you know, irresistible grace, and we know it is irresistible. And uh, there's nothing else to say except thank you. And uh, you've given us all these books, and there's just too much to uh, to look at. And uh, we're not going to get, uh, we're just scratching the surface here of what you are and uh, what you want from us, of us. And hopefully one day uh, we'll be able to see your glory. Uh, and that's what I'm I'm hoping for. You know, I want to be with you wherever that is. Uh, where we go after this, and I know we go somewhere after this. And uh, I want to be there with you and, and your son, and uh, be there forever. And we thank you. We love you. In Jesus name. Amen. That's it. Amen. Uh, my thing came back. Nope, I don't know how to get this back. So anyway, I don't know how to get my uh, uh, mute microphone. Nope. No. Okay. Well, let me stop recording first of all. Can we rambling on over here? All right.